Winecast is brought to you by Balzac Wine Bar on Milwaukee's east side. Balzac offers complimentary samples and discounted wines featured on My Wine School's Winecast. See Balzac's wine page on the My Wine School website under Retailers for more details. So we're back for more bubbles. And um, I'm Jessica Bell from My Wine School, where it's wine your way. Welcome back to those of you who are with us for the Wine Newbie Winecast number 22. Everyone say hello to Karen. Hi. <laughs> um, we're getting into the New Year's Eve spirit early. Maybe we'll just keep it rolling. We'll just start on Wednesday and just keep it rolling till what is it, Friday, Saturday? Saturday. Saturday? Oh, we could do that. Okay. So um, if you're wondering how to say hello to Karen, then um, this is how you do it. This is how you become a part of the conversation. We broadcast live from our homepage off to the right. Just type anything in under audience. It'll take you to the screen. Uh, you can either log in or sign up. And if you decide to sign up today, uh, you just fill in the five fields and boom, you are a part of the conversation. So here we are at Winecast number 23 and this is designed for our wine explorers so today we're going to be doing uh taltarni brutache is our wine and we're going to be talking about the traditional method and it's like what the heck is that you know don't worry i'm gonna tell you and i'm i've only got a half hour to do it so i um i'm gonna blow through this let me know though if you have any questions that is the beauty of this setup is that you can stop me and ask questions at any time so um, if you watched the last wine cast, the uh, number, what, 22, Two. thank you, uh, already the bubbles are kind of getting to my head, then um, I want to know how you're going to chill your bottle of wine on New Year's Eve. So let us know how you're going to chill your bottle of wine on New Year's Eve. And um, Karen, do you have plans for New Year's Eve? Uh, I think I'll be enjoying a rosé. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Karen and I are going to... We're gonna crazy. We're gonna get crazy. Yeah, that will will uh, bring back those old crazy Spanish days and <laughs> on in my living room. <laughs> with your daughter. Yes, with my daughter. I said maybe she'll stay up till ten. She's an eighteen month old. We'll maybe get her up till ten. So um, I want to know, um, you know, do you guys have plans to drink uh, sparkling wine or champagne? And we talked about that in the last wine cast. There is a difference between sparkling wine and champagne. All champagne is sparkling wine, but not all sparkling wine is champagne, right? Because if it's champagne, it has to come from a defined region within France called champagne, and it's enforced by law. That Actually, it would be confiscated if someone tried to put champagne on their bottle and they were not from the region of champagne. So um, you definitely, um, you know, it, it doesn't really matter, but it's good to know. And it's good to know why there's a difference. Why are the Champenois, the people from Champagne, so particular about the fact that no one can use their name? And we're going to talk about that uh, today. Now, the thing is, is with Champagne, though, is that a Champagne will cost you. So if it does have that word on it, it's going to cost you a little bit more money. The reason is because it's a defined region and they have a specific method which is the traditional method, right? That's what we're gonna be talking about today. The traditional method is what they use to make their wines. Uh, and because it's a limited production and there is lots of demand, the price is quite a lot higher than say uh, other sparkling wines of the world. So, um, you know, it's interesting. I think when I first got into wine, when people would tell me, oh, you know, this wine, it's, there's, it's unlike any other, I would, my, my instinct would be like, yeah, right, okay? Sparkling wine, champagne, what's the difference? Is it really that different? And I'll tell you, after many years of drinking lots and lots of wine and lots and lots of sparkling wine, I can say there is a difference. And I, you know, it, it, it's not all bad news though. There is some good news to that because like I said, champagne is a distinct style and it's more expensive. But if you don't like the style, then don't buy it. You, you know, you don't have to buy champagne. Um, but also, there is good news that there are other lookalikes out there. So it's difficult to get the exact style of champagne if it's outside of champagne, but you can really find some wines at a half or a third of the price that are reminiscent of a, a real champagne. So, and that's why I love this wine that we're having today. It really reminds me of champagne and it comes in at a half or even a third of the price of most champagnes. And this one is, let's see here, very wet. <laughs> um, but this is our, our Taltarni. 
And you can see it's the Brut Tache there. And we're going to talk about what Tache means on the, on the next wine cache. Wine cast. You can see at the bottom though it says sparkling wine. Okay, it does not say champagne, and this comes from Australia. So it's not from champagne. It can't be called champagne. So, but why? Why? What makes this wine halfway across the world in champ in uh, Australia somewhat similar to champagne? And the things we want to compare are things that there's lots of things that we could compare. But the four things that I think are going to be the most influential are going to be climate, soil. Uh, grapes and production method. So let's start with climate. Champagne is grown in France at 49 degrees north latitude. That is really far north for growing grapes. Grapes can technically only be grown between the 30 and 50 degrees north and south of the equator. So at 49, we're really far north for growing grapes. Now this wine comes from uh, Australia and also some of the grapes come from an island south of Australia called Tasmania and that's at 42 degrees south. Now that doesn't seem as far, is not as extreme as say Champagne, but really when you get to the uh, Southern Hemisphere, no one even get, no one even touches Champagne. The most, the most southerly grape growing region in the Southern Hemisphere is at only at 45 degrees south, and that's in New Zealand. So 42 degrees south is fairly far south, and it has a lot of really cold winds. So we get kind of a, a cold climate. So both of them have a cool climate. Maybe Tasmania is not as cool as Champagne, but we've got a similarity there. The second thing is soil. So Champagne has this soil that is, um, well, for, for time, for the, in the interest of time, we're just gonna say chalk. It's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but chalk, very chalky soils. Now this is where it becomes very difficult for another region to replicate because soil is a result of millions of years of this particular place in the world coming together just the way it is. Now, that happens everywhere in the world. That is important everywhere, but here it works with wine. So where we're standing, it took millions of years for us to create the soil under our feet, but it's not good for growing wine. But this, this chalky soil is fantastic for growing this type of wine, this sparkling wine. Now, the uh, soil in Tasmania or in, uh, at Taltarni is things like red clay, quartz, volcanic, very, very different, more of warmer soils, wetter soils. Um, although chalk is wet, so I don't, um, we're not gonna get into soils today, but it is very different and it's very difficult to replicate that. Now, the other thing are grapes. So grapes uh, in Champagne are Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Pinot Meunier. Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier are the dark-skinned grapes, and Chardonnay is a white-skinned grape. Now this is where Taltarni and a lot of other look-alikes can really follow the same equation. Uh, most other regions will use lots of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and most of you have heard of those grapes, and they're very um, widely planted. Now this wine, actually from Taltarni, the one we're having tonight, actually uses Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Pinot Meunier. Now that is unusual to use all three grapes from uh, uh, Champagne. So let's see. Now, th before we talk about the next, uh, the next thing that I think really makes a wine Champagne-like, which is the production method, which we call traditional method, I want to do wine IQ number one. So here we go. Wine interactive question number one. What kind of grapes can we expect from a cooler climate? A, fruity with high sugars, B, high acid and low sugars, C, high potential alcohol, or D, only red wines. So while you're talking about that, or while you're doing that rather, um, you can talk about it too, but I wanna talk about the fourth factor in uh, influencing wine styles. So we said there's climate, there's soil, there's grapes, and now there's production method. And this production method I mentioned is called the traditional method. And this traditional method, which was at one time called the champagne method, was created in champagne. And as we said earlier in winecast number 21, uh, 22, 22, um, champagne has a really long history. So they have been making this wine, developing this wine for a long, long time, and they've been able to perfect it. And so most places in the world try to replicate that same, that same method, that same procedure. Now, um, when we talk about it, there's a lot of things that come into play uh, with regards to this method. Now, it's interesting because as I mentioned earlier, champagne can only be used from 
wines from Champagne. Now, that happened, I said, in the 1890s. Well, in the 1990s, they said, you know what? You can't even use Champagne method. You can say, you, can, you can't say it comes from Champagne, or you can't call it Champagne, and you can't say it uses the Champagne method. So this is where we got the idea, traditional method. Now, um, if you look on the labels, um, let's see if this one says, um, this one I don't think actually even says traditional method. But if you get, would you mind, oh, here it is. The other one here, you actually see the traditional method on the label, and you'll often see that. So if you look at this bottle here at the top there, or at the bottom, you can see Méthode Traditionnelle. Now it is called the traditional method, but not everyone speaks English. I know, shocker, right? But so what you'll see is traditional method in the language where it's grown. So in, in France, you see Méthode Traditionnelle. That's a sign that they use the same process as they do in Champagne. In uh, Spain, Méthode Traditionnelle. Traditional. Um, and then in, Eng in English, we'll see the traditional method. So that's what we're going to be looking for from our uh, bottles to get the same, a similar style to champagne. Now let's see, any um, answers on uh, wine IQ number one? Yeah, we have a couple B's coming in. Couple B's. So high acid and low sugar. Perfect. If you are having, a, if you have a cool climate, the acid's going to be high and the sugars are low. And that is of vital importance to making sparkling wine. Sparkling wine should be high in acid, and the reason is is that uh, high acid is gonna make it taste better. Think about warm, uh, or let's see, yeah, well, that's a different analogy. I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> Getting all my analogies mixed up tonight. Okay, but um, the reason why you want high acid is because it's more stable, and it's gonna hold on to the bubbles better. It's, it's, it's uh, gonna retain that carbonation that you worked so hard to get. And also it's gonna affect the flavor. So let's go, let's actually, um, we're gonna actually try this wine and taste it, but let's skip over the color because we're gonna talk about that in the next wine cast, which is rosé sparkling wines, which are some of my favorite. Let's actually go to the nose on this one. So go ahead and, and smell the wine and let me know what you would smell. Now, uh, I'm already getting some some uh, some answers here coming in quickly. Great. So, what's interesting is that with cool weather, a cool weather climate, we should be smelling some citrus. And I don't know if anyone's getting citrus or um, any other things. I don't know. I'm not saying there is, but I'm saying a cooler climate usually you'll get citrus and cooler fruits like um, a green apple and um, you know uh, unripe peaches and those types of things. So I see some people coming in with apple, A, lots of fruit, which is interesting. This is a new world sparkling wine. And so we're actually, yeah, we're getting more fruit than we might get in say Champagne. Even though it's a cool climate, it's not as cool as it is in Champagne. And so we're getting some of that fruit on the wine as well. Um, but Karen, you mentioned earlier that you got a lot of uh, earth on this wine yeah. as well. <clears throat> I did, big time. Now that I'm smelling it, I don't know if I just have Christmas cookies on the brain, but Sugar cookies. Sugar cookies, yeah. Well, you know what's interesting is a couple of things. One is the earthiness. This is why I like this wine. This is why I think this wine approaches a, a champagne style because it has a more pronounced earthiness than some other New World wines. You don't, um, a lot of New World wines will only be fruit. Uh, New World sparkling wines will only be fruit, whereas this has a lot of good earthiness on it. And then you said cookies. Now cookies is interesting because that usually comes from the Chardonnay being used and also from a little bit of age on a sparkling wine. So that's actually a great sign. That's showing that this wine can withstand a little bit of age and, and start to develop in a really positive way. Um, Let's see, any other comments? I think that was everything for the, uh, for the, the nose. Okay, so um, now let's talk about this process of, uh, of the traditional method and how it, what is it? What, you know, what's so special about it? Well, the traditional method is the idea that fermentation, or rather secondary fermentation, happens in the bottle that's sold to you. Uh, that sounds kind of kooky, but let me, I'm gonna take you through it. So what we've got going on is um, they're gonna harvest, uh, let's say we'll talk about tar tall Tarni. They've got uh, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Pinot Meunier in this, in this wine, just like Champagne. And they'll harvest those grapes, 
and they'll make a still wine, just as they would a, a Pinot Noir or a Chardonnay. Then they'll blend those different grapes. Sometimes they blend vintages. Um, looks like this one is non-vintage, but usually Taltarni is a vintage, which is interesting. I don't see, might be on the back here. Um, but what we have is a wine, and then they put it into a bottle, just like, it wouldn't be just like this bottle, but they'll put it into a glass bottle that eventually is gonna be sold to you. That is the key. And then we've got a wine, and it's got really, really high acid, it's got low sugar, so it's only at about 10% alcohol. Most wines are at around 12 to 14% alcohol. They're gonna add yeast and sugar, and that is gonna create a secondary fermentation. Now we're gonna close the bottle after we put our new yeast and new sugar in, and there's gonna be a secondary fermentation. So this becomes a little fermentation tank, right? And that's why it's expensive to have the traditional method is because you've got like a million different fermentation tanks happening. They're all their own little fermentation tanks. So we're gonna close it up and then the yeast are gonna eat the sugar and they're gonna produce more alcohol. So it's gonna go up to say 12% alcohol and it's gonna create carbon dioxide. But because it's sealed, the CO2 has nowhere to go but back into the wine and that's how we get the sparkle on our sparkling wines. Now here's a picture of after the fact that the yeast is eating the sugar. And this is from a cellar, this is a, a cava cellar in Spain. And that arrow, what it's showing you is at the bottom is where all the dead yeast cells go. They don't just disappear, they fall to the bottom and they have gooky, I mean they're sticky and they stick to the bottle. Now most good champagnes or sparkling wines will age like this for some time and they'll, they'll take some of the flavors from those dead yeast cells that are at the bottom. But at some point we're gonna have to get that dead yeast, those dead yeast cells out because it, it, you know, think of all your champagnes that you've had. They're, they're crystal clear. You don't want floaters, okay? So back in the 19th century, we have a, a very smart lady, Vouve Clicquot, who said, you know what, I've got an idea. So she took her desk and put a bunch of holes in it, and this is what we call the first example of a, uh, a riddling table. Now what this does is uh, puts a bottle in, and so you've got the, this, the, this dead yeast cells here, and uh, an experienced Riddler, or someone who turns the bottles, will come around and shake the bottles, turn them, and make them go a little bit more vertical. And what that does, the shaking, is it releases it from the side of the bottle, but then helps it go down to the neck of the bottle. So this was the first uh, iteration of a um, of Riddling, but this is what they look like these days. They're basically um, an upside down V, and you can have an experienced Riddler who can do 35 to 40,000 bottles in one day. That's a lot of, I mean, you gotta be experienced, but they'll go around, shake, twist, turn, and then what they're gonna eventually do is go from, say, a 45 degree angle all the way vertical. And um, nowadays, though, also, you've got uh, more uh, mach uh, uh, machinery, I guess you could say, and these are called gyro pallets. These do the same work as a person can do in only seven days, whereas it usually takes about eight to ten weeks to do it by hand. So it's a little bit more vigorous, a little bit more invasive, so it's not seen as for, usually the higher quality wines won't use these gyro pallets. But it, it doesn't make that much of a difference if you want to sell your wine, say, at the you know under $20 price point. And the, this gentleman sells one of the best cavas in Spain. Um, and what we're ultimately looking to get from not only this riddling table, but this riddling table and this gyro palette is this result here. That is, once the bottle has been, is vertical, you can see in the neck of the bottle, that's all the dead yeast cells. They're all there in the neck of the bottle. And usually, as you can see, it's closed with a bottle cap. So you've got the bottle cap there. And now you've got it at the bottom, at the, at, at the neck. Now, what do you do? Now you gotta get it out. So what usually happens is they're gonna put all the bottles upside down. You can see in this picture off to the left, you can see the bottles upside down. They, they kind of got a rounded bottom. But you can see they're all in um, a frozen brine solution, which is going to freeze everything in the neck so that um, when it comes time to remove the cork, the sparkling wine stays in the bottle and the dead yeast cells basically ooze out. Okay, Here, this picture is again at the same Cava house and they were hand, it's called degorgement or disgorgement. They were disgorging 
the bottles by hand, which is rarely done anymore. They were, I think they were putting on a show for me, you know, great, great photo op and what, they're a great house, but I don't, they do, they say they do this for their high end uh, blend, which um, perhaps they do, um, but it's very um, unrealistic these days. Um, in fact, if you look at the dressing on all your champagne bottles, they all have this really long neck dressing. You can see how that goes all the way down. The reason for that was because when everything was hand disgorged, the levels at which the wine would end up would be very different because they couldn't control it as much. And so this allowed there to be a cover up almost of the different levels of wine in the bottle. So that's why it's, it's now more for traditional reasons because they're all right around the same level. But that's the reason why you've got the, the dressing on the neck like that. Okay, so then the next thing after it's disgorged is that they're going to add just a little bit of sugar into the wine, um, a little bit of wine as well, and, and then they're going to put in a, a, a cork, which it, when it goes in first, it actually looks like um, a cylinder. It's from all the pressure that you get this mushroom shape. So that's, um, that's just from the pressure. And uh, they're going to add sugar not to make it sweet, but to create balance. Like I said, these are really high acid wines. If we didn't put sugar in a lot of these, they would be very aggressive wines and they would not be fun to drink. So I think I've got through everything. Let's actually go ahead. I think we've smelled it. Let's go ahead and take a sip. I'm sure you've been sipping along with me. Um, Karen's Just been- a little. <laughs> I like that, Christine. Riddle me that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you know, and Christine mentioned cool info. It's, sparkling wine is one of my favorites, not because, not only because I love to drink it, and I, I do, I think it's just so versatile with food and wine pairings, which we're going to talk about in the next wine cast. But it really is a artisanal product. There really is a lot of work that goes into these sparkling wines, from the blending at the beginning of different grapes and different vintages to the aging of it, to the riddling, the degorgement, and then the adding of sugar. It's a very it's a very um, artisanal product. There's a lot of thought that goes into it. So um, cheers to that, Christine. Um, and Justin. Cheers to Justin. Cheers to Justin. Okay, cheers to Justin, too. Um, that was actually Justin. <laughs> well done, Justin. Okay. Um, so take a sip. You know, um, we're going to talk about uh, the sugar level in the next wine cast because we'll say, well, is this sweet or dry? It's dry, right? This is bone dry. And, um, not bone dry, but it's it's dry. Uh, you'll see on the label there, Brut, again, that's going to um, tell you that it's a dry style of uh, sparkling wine. Um, and, you know, this uses this traditional method. Uh, as, you, as you've seen, that this is a very labor-intensive process. And I think we're getting a jump in screen. Sorry, I think the computer has uh, drank a little too much of my sparkling wine. Whoa, it's going a little crazy now. <laughs> This has never happened before. Okay, um, no, it's not jumping. You guys have just drank too much. So, but we're gonna actually, we've gotta sign off for the next wine cast. Um, but um, we're gonna talk about wine pairings for this wine. We're gonna continue with this wine, the Taltani wine in the next wine cast. And we're gonna see what you think about this wine. But in the future, if you're looking for styles of champagne um, that aren't champagne, then what you wanna look for are wines that share a similar climate. So you're looking for cool climates. Similar grapes, so Chardonnay and Pinot Noir would be the grapes, and then you're looking for the traditional method. If you find those three things, you really are going to be in luck as, in terms of finding something that's a look-alike. Now, there are a couple places that, there are a lot of places that use the traditional method, but the ones that use it and come in at a half or a third of the price of champagne would be in Spain. It's called Cava, and they use the traditional method. They don't use Pinot Noir. They do use a little Chardonnay, um, but Cremant. Cremant all over France. It's basically sparkling wine from France using the traditional method, but not from Champagne. Great values there. And then the New World. There's, this is a great example of a New World sparkling wine. A couple other New World sparkling wines uh, that I really like, that I think do really well in the price quality uh, relationship, are Grue, which we've had before. It comes in around 15 bucks. If you're looking for a wine for New Year's Eve, great um, style. It actually is very similar in climate and soil, which is difficult to find, and grapes, and it uses the traditional method. So very similar to uh, Champagne, and at the price, it's unbeatable. The Rotor Estate is one of my favorites. Uh, Rotor is actually a Champagne house, which has set up 
shop in California, that's usually around the $25 mark, so you're spending a little bit more, but you actually get a really nice champagne-like uh, sparkling wine from the New World. And then, of course, Tall Tarni is a, uh, another um, good one that I find is a good look-alike. Um, so I think that's all we've got the time we've got time for. Are there any questions or Christine just asking how close Mom or Chandon is to the traditional method? Well, great, great question. So Mom and Ch or Chandon, they are they, they are from owners of champagne houses. So they already understand the traditional method really well. They understand the production of champagne. They're, all, they're also going to be good examples of uh, sparkling wines that are similar to champagne. But again, it's new world, you're going to get more fruit. Um, and they're usually, both of those I think are right around $20, $25 as well. So it's in the same vein as Rodeur, uh, Rodeur Estate, which is, it just happens to be one of my favorites of the champagne houses in California. But these are also just as, probably just as good uh, as uh, the Rodeur Estate. Rotor State, I just tend to find, tends to have more of the Champagne-esque than the Mum or the Chandon. But that's my personal opinion. So that's all the time we have for today. Um, we're going to sign back on in about two minutes, so stick with us. Um, I uh, will have more wine for Karen and I then. And I'm Jessica Bell from My Wine School, where it is wine your way. <laughs>